Hey, everybody. Welcome on back. This is the Twisted History Podcast. My name is Large. Sitting to my right is my lovely wife, St. Anne. Sitting to her right is our lovely friend, Jeff Vibbert. May know hello, hello. Uh, John will be the voice of God on this one, uh, but I want to thank Jason for setting us up here in the uh, podcast room one at Barstool HQ3, uh, located conveniently within walking distance of Madison Square Garden. Today we're doing uh, listener submissions for the November uh, edition of Twisted History, November 2024. And I like to do listener submissions around this time of year because inadvertently or advertently, it provides people with stuff to talk about at the table um, at both Thanksgiving and at Christmas without having to like do too much deep diving into the Holocaust or anything like that. So some of this is a little bit silly, some of it isn't, uh, and most of it had come from you, the listeners, on what you thought that we, the uh, hosts of Twisted History, would like to talk about. Uh, before we get started, I want to talk about Paint Your Life. We got very lucky last episode. We had a gentleman who had mailed us in a letter saying how he'd gotten it, perhaps for his grandmother or something. The, the thing is a little bit blurry. We had Willie Colon on, so I was able to read the letter, go right into the ad read, and i got to be honest, I thought it was one of the best testaments because they always ask us for our testaments of whatever we're pushing here. And this guy said, thank you so much for not only pushing dick pills and energy drinks or something like that. And, um, and he's right. It's actually one of the like special things that I think just about anybody can get. Uh, anybody who loves somebody else, or even if you love yourself, uh, you can get one of these. What is it? Uh, it's Paint Your Life. It transforms your photos into one-of-a-kind, beautiful hand-painted portraits by professional artists. So you get a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo for a deeply meaningful holiday gift. This is an AI. This is you being given an artist, you giving the artist your pictures, and that artist painting your picture uh, into paintings. And they can put them into different scenes, scenes from history, silly stuff, whatever you want. So this isn't one of those like cheapo AI things that the kids are so in touch with nowadays. There's no end to what you can do. You can have your artist combine multiple photos, ask your artist to add embellishments, change a wardrobe, put yourself in a location you always wanted to go, or add a lost loved one to a special occasion for a portrait you've always dreamed of. You can upgrade your portrait with a custom frame, just about everything. So this holiday season, you can give the most meaningful gift you've ever given from paintyourlife.com. And there's no risk. If you don't like the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. And right now, as a limited time offer, get 20 percent off your painting that's right 20 percent off and free shipping to get this special offer you gotta listen to this one text the word twisted to 87204 twisted 87204 text twisted to 87204 paint your life celebrate the moments that matter most message and data rates may apply see terms for detail all right, so we're going to have a little bit of fun uh, with this week, and we're going to be doing it uh, with the help of people who have written in. And I didn't get a lot. I didn't get right into it last week with Willie, but a couple of people sent in a factoid after we did Japanese customs. Um, people found this very interesting, and when I mentioned at the dinner table, our son Finnegan also found it very interesting, but Okinawa. Okinawa, I don't know. Maybe somebody can explain it to me. I decided not to do legwork on it. I think it's a it's a cluster of islands with maybe Okinawa being a like one of the islands itself, kind of like Hawaii. I'm not really sure, but anyway, Okinawa in Japan, where my wife's father is actually stationed during... Vietnam? Korean War? No, it was, it was later. It, it was... Oh, just honest, whatever? Well, it was before Vietnam, but it was during his... He just signed up to be in the Air Force. Okay, so, so he was... Because yeah, like U.S., I guess, kind of owned it. I, I'm not doing the Twisted History of Okinawa today, so no. you'll have to explain my... Excuse me, excuse my ignorance, but I know that we had uh, a considerable military presence there for a long time. I don't know if it was ever like a Guam, but it's no longer owned by us by any stretch of the imagination. But the point that people had made to me is that as we're talking about uh, Japan, life expectancies and whatnot, Okinawa is a unicorn. The average uh, life expectancy uh, in developed nations is somewhere between like 74 and 77. In Okinawa, it's above 80, and they have more centenarians, uh, meaning people who are 100 years or older, per capita than any place in the world. So right. Okinawa is a very good place to fucking grow old. Yeah. The what is it? Good Morning America, where they put them on like a, a yeah. Smucker's jar. And yeah. Like... Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they put them on a jar of miso, perhaps over there. I'm trying not to be socially uh, inappropriate. I can I say I keep getting uh, uh, 
tattoo Instagram things pop up and the Kappa, the thing with the bowl on its yeah. head. Yeah. It's, I, I know what it is now. I keep getting those tattooed yeah. on them, and I'm like, oh, it's Kappa. I think when we did that, a Nico Nikki or whatever, mm-hmm. the cat who does yeah. this, like I feel like that's made me a better person. Are you using the uh, correct arm? I be, well, you can do either arm. This is for yeah. wealth, and this is for happiness, I think. Um, the Kappa is one. You're right. Phones are listening to us. Oh, uh, for sure. 100%. Spying on us. So, but I'm seeing a lot more of the shit that we talk about. But so um, it's so well known that it's actually considered a blue zone where people have exceptionally long life expectancies. I think they, I don't know where they got blue zone. I said yesterday to you is because blue hair is being older and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't really care about Japanese people living past a hundred, but what I did like is that when they asked what factors uh, contributed to that longevity in Okinawa, a lot of them have a primarily plant-based diet because they do their own gardening there. Everybody seems to have gardening as a hobby, which I know is extremely healthy. But they also do this thing. Listen, I've been trying to diet now for the past year and a half, as Annie has. They do something called harahachi bu, which means they eat until they're 80% full. I'm try- I, I said to you last night, I'm still trying to figure out how you know when you're 80% full. Yeah, that's... Well, then, yeah, and, then, and I, they're not looking at a... A fuel gauge, right? No, I know that, but if if I like something, I sit down and eat. How much is on their plate that... I mean, how do you say... Like, I'm fucking around now. I don't bring out big plates anymore. Vibs, I only eat off small plates. Oh, I I eat until I'm uncomfortable. Like I I eat until I hate myself. That's that's how it's been forever. Yeah. And that's why I'm not a leftovers guy, because I... I go to town on things so much so even if they're the most delicious thing in the world, I don't want to see them for a fucking couple mm-hmm. of weeks. Mm-hmm. So these people are eating until they're 80% full. And to Annie's point, I think you just sort of know after doing it for 100 years. That's self-discipline. That's yeah. something we just don't have. We don't have it. Yeah. We don't have it. And But by the way, you asked about um, Okinawa. Okinawa was placed under the U.S. administration until 72 when it reverted back to Japan. Japan. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Can I drop a factoid into you? You're asking where the name Blue Zone came from? Uh, in 2005, Dan Butner coined the term, and it refers to the blue pin he used to mark the areas on the map. Oh, get out of so here. Very like inside baseball on why they call it a blue zone. It seems that a lot of it is island um, related. Yeah, like people there. I think there's one of the other blue zones is like an island off the coast of Greece, I believe. Like there are very few where there's mm. so many 100 year old people uh, walking around. But anyway. Do you want so, to be that old? Like, do you want to yes. live until you're over 100? Yeah, so I'm 53 right now, and it's 2024. Mm -hmm. So 47 years from now would be 2071. And I'm thinking that we might have some sort of way to make my brain. And you want to be that old? Yeah, I want them to. You want to be that old? No, no, I don't. Like, my grandpa's 93, and he he gets around. He can still drive, but he's miserable. Granted, he doesn't have, like, Wi-Fi or the Internet. If he had the Internet, things would be awesome. If I could stay like this and, you know... 100 years that's different yeah. but yeah. you see somebody when they're 93 he gets, he gets or, tired walking to the mailbox yeah, I don't like, oh. be. we're just all gonna pretend that his dad his grandfather should still be driving he's 93 it, he, 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 menace to society. He, he does pretty well <laughs> I, I, I was driving behind him the other day i was like all right I'm not, I was in the he, no judgment. he only drives like down the street to the restaurant he goes to or How like you know that? what i mean yeah he is it a big old caddy like does he drive a huge he car? drives a uh an old Delta buick 88? an old buick like like you. Pacifica or something like that. It's, it's a big car, but it's it's the best car I've ever had. Yeah, I was like, Grandpa, if you best. only knew the technology that's in cars now, he oh, doesn't want it. No, no. He well, he doesn't even. It. I asked him if he had Wi-Fi the other day because we were trying to watch a game, and he's like, I don't, "What is Wi?" He didn't know what Wi-Fi was, which is oh. crazy. That's wonderful. Though. Now yeah. you know what to give him for Christmas. Uh, I want to get him a DVD player, but he won't even so he can watch old movies. But he won't. He's like, I don't want that. I don't, really? Don't, I don't want. Best thing I gave my mother was the Alexa. Loves the Alexa. Yeah. And it's, it's like so weird. To the phone, like to the it's, TV. She, it's yeah. like her. She, she's like friends with it now, isn't she? Right. Oh, she walks in. Alexa, what time is it? Alexa, put on MacGyver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but you said, do I want to live to 100? I want to live as long as possible and be as big of a burden to as many people as possible. But as healthy as right. possible, right? You don't yeah, want to be that guy that. I don't want to be in pain necessarily. First of all, you don't want anybody in the bathroom with you. Well, then I'm going to have to. I, I, know, I know. Whatever. We'll get, we'll get a series of like, you know, winches and, and lifts so you can move me from bed to bathroom. And stuff I'm like going to be like, like you're going to be like in the uh, a loading dock. Yep. Are you are you comfortable <laughs> with someone wiping your ass? Like, do you want that or you want? I spent a year. I spent nine months, excuse me, in in bed when I broke my leg. I missed my freshman year of high school. So it was bedpans and urinals. My mom was really a saint. 
uh, throughout the whole thing because I had these pieces put into my legs, so I just couldn't move. And I was cast from the tip of my toes all the way up to my uh, crotch. And um, it wasn't an ideal situation, no. no. But I think the older I get, the more I'm being realistic. That's why I'm being nice to the kids. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm open that mm -hmm. when they think about it, they go it's with really the more two ply. Right? Does, it falls on the daughter. It's like that Hitchcock movie, Rear Window, where you, you got your leg broken and you just uh. sit in the in the. Fuck it, chair man. for nine months that's crazy um we had willie cologne on last uh I'm dying first by the way what's that i'm dying first by the way yeah, hopefully do you think you'll die like a week after if she dies no no you'll no, no i'm gonna keep he's it going. gonna live forever i'm gonna try to keep going I'm not trying to be blasted but jimmy carter his wife died and now he's they were in love and he thought he'd die like the next day and he's, right. he's still kicking he's, he's, still hanging on. he's, he's, he's been in hospice for like a year and a half i read yesterday marilyn monroe was born the same year as queen elizabeth yeah that's she's cool. That's wild. She is yeah. stunning. So they they found a picture of her in um just like at a flea market or something that some kid had taken and she just his own camera whatever year it was it was maybe late 50s early 60s. There's nothing on that lens. That woman was stunning. Yeah, she was. Wow. Queen Elizabeth we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she was fucking old. Dry balls. Uh, <laughs> we, thanks uh, to Willie Cologne came in. We banged it out as myself, Best. Willie and Jeff. And um, Annie's like, there's too many personalities in the room. So she had taken uh, an episode off, which I appreciate. Um, but it was kind of nice because you'd been to breakfast so many times. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was kind of right from your perspective on the outside looking in. And obviously me and Willie are asshole buddies. Yeah. I, I mean, I learned I learned some things, too, I did, that I yeah. didn't know. I, Piece together the details. I got so much good feedback on that fucking episode. That was a great episode. Except it just reignites. Uh, people's uh, desire to have us do Barstool Breakfast again. Yeah. Um, which I think is very, very cool, and it makes me feel good. I just don't know how I'd be able to get it done. But I would jump at any opportunity to anyone who's listening to do anything with Willie, um, be it in a paper bag or on a morning uh, radio show. But right before we gave um, Willie the mic, I had said this isn't going to be a traditional twisted history. I'm not going to just throw out a fact. And I'd thrown out like a really small random fact and someone had written in William. Actually, yeah, so we're talking to Willie, guy William written in. You gave a quick fact before the last episode about Ritz Carlton. Was that true? And so I'll start with that and say, yes, it was. Um, I was riding the London Eye a couple of weeks ago. I had time before I had my flight that night. So I jumped on that um, giant uh, merry go round first. Ferris wheel. Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, it's a waste of money. I think it's like I paid an extra five quid. Uh, to go a fast lane. So I think it was like 40-something bucks to ride the thing. Uh. Um, but what it does, for people who don't know, so the River Thames runs through London, and uh, we were staying right by uh, Big Ben and all that kind of stuff. And so when you go on this London Eye, uh, you get a really good view of the whole city. You can see forever. You really can see forever. And depending on which side you're looking at, the... Um, there's a PA system that gives you a small tour. If you look out over here, you look out over mm -hmm. here. Um, so it's kind of cool. And one of the things that they had shown us was the Savoy Hotel, uh, which is in the Strand area of London, right on the River Thames. And they gave a quick factoid about it. And so I'm going to uh, talk about it now. Uh, people eat, steal from hotels all the time, myself included. When I was a single guy and you would come over to my apartment, you only would use a shower and use towels from, you know, Four Seasons. Because yep. when I'd stay there, we had a reciprocal agreement with them when I worked for uh, down south. So we just had like Four Seasons mm -hmm. towels. Not just Four Seasons towels. We also had Red Roof Inn towels. I used to steal towels for some reason all the time. I also used to steal steak knives whenever I went to a steakhouse as a kid. Or and so. Lamps. When you would come, yeah, pig lamps. Whenever you'd come to our house and you'd use uh, have a steak knife, it used to be like uh, from a box, and you'd be like, "Oh my god, this is a whole old homestead. This is Sparks. This is." It was a very cool thing. I don't know why I got rid of that box. I think I've spoke about it before, at least on this podcast and beyond. I should have saved that box. It had maybe thirty or forty different knives from thirty or forty different iconic restaurants uh, in New York City. That's kind of cool. You do that every now and then. You purge stuff and then you. Immediately I regret, regret it. it. I fucking regret mm -hmm. it. And it's all the cool stuff, too. Uh, and it's not that, that I'm being pressured to throw the shit out by her. It's not. You know what I mean? Because she hoards stuff that I don't understand either, and we kind of leave each other alone. And uh, <laughs> But that was it. So anyway, in 2005, this isn't the story that I started with with Willie, but in 2005, the Savoy Hotel in London had police raid the apartment of a 54-year-old employee who worked there for 18 years, and the police had found 4,000 pounds... 
pounds, meaning measurement of weight, worth the shit he stole from the hotel. 200 pieces of china, teapots, glasses, napkins, silver trays, a candelabra, a mirror, 31 jars of jam, which is aggressive, glass vases or vases and a shelving unit. I wasn't impressed, so I wasn't going to follow up on this thing until I found out it was his ex-wife that turned him in. He got divorced, and then she dropped a dime to the cops. That's it's, that's fucking great. Yeah, yeah. So he's a dickhead. I, it's 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 yeah. warranted. But all he got was 150 hours of community service. So good for him, and fuck her, I guess. Right? I mean, well, you don't know way. what he was like. I mean, maybe he deserved I, it. I heard she hit him. No, so either way, so that that's the type of stuff that happens in and around the Savoy Hotel, which is they it was the premier hotel in London, maybe it still is, but for over a hundred years, it was the place to see and be seen. Um, the Savoy is kind of like our Plaza Hotel here in New York. Mm -hmm. Plaza Hotel probably isn't the finest hotel in New York, but it might be the most recognizable from the right? commercials. Was that the well, whether you came out well the Ladies came out and dancing. On the I think so, yeah. Marshall. Savoy doesn't have Home Alone 2 films at it. Home Alone 2, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Algonquin Roundtable. But so that's the type of hotel that we're dealing with, with the Savoy. It was the first real luxury hotel in Britain and the first to introduce electric lights throughout the building. It was the first to have elevators. It was the first to have bathrooms in every room. And it was the first to have constantly hot and cold running water. So this was a big deal. And one of the reasons it was so fancy and successful was they hired a gentleman named Caesar Ritz. Two of my favorite things, a Caesar salad and a Ritz cracker. His name is Caesar Ritz. By the way, Caesar salad is not named after Julius Caesar. Do you know this? Uh, I, Do you I know did not. No, because all the, the Caesar dressing things have like Caesar, Caesar on them. On it. like yeah. It's a dude named, Jesus, Caesar something. And he was an Italian chef who was in California. And um, when Prohibition came, his restaurant was dying. So he moved his restaurant to Tijuana. And he opened up the restaurant Tijuana, and there, uh, the Italian restaurant that he had down there, started this salad, um, and they named it the Caesar Salad after the chef. So Caesar cool. Salad isn't after Julius Caesar; it's about an Italian chef who uh, made it up in a Mexican restaurant. But either way, this guy's name is—that's another thing that just came off the fucking dome. This guy, Caesar Ritz, was the hotel manager of the Savoy Hotel in 1889. Okay, so this is a long fucking time ago. And his hotel attracted royalty and other rich and powerful guests. Let's go down the list of some of the people who used to stay regularly at the Savoy Hotel. Claude Monet, you ever heard of him? George Gershwin, Frank Sinatra, King Edward VII, Oscar Wilde, Charlie Chaplin, Babe Ruth, Harry Truman, Judy Garland, John Wayne, Lawrence Olivier, Mar Marilyn Monroe, Humphrey Bogart, Elizabeth Taylor, Bob Dylan, Led Zeppelin, and the Beatles. And Winston Churchill often took his cabinet lunch at the hotel. So, right, another big deal. It was one of the first hotels that catered to celebrity needs. The hotel kept records of its guests' preferences so that it could provide for them in advance. And for English English, English playwright Noel Coward, the staff made history by taking the first photographs of his toilet articles during his stay so they could lay it out for him during future uh, hotel stays so his bathroom was exactly like he You liked. would love that. If I checked into a hotel and they You'd said- You'd have your own, your old gold bonds? Yeah. Mr. Your McCarthy, <laughs> my, my given name, Mr. McCarthy, go up to your hotel, just unpack your dop kit, set up Alcohol your bathroom. Pads. We're going to have a photographer come up and just take it so we know for next time. That's and then tips. don't bring your fucking dop kit. Mm, and the next awesome. time I go there, I have Q-tips here, gold I'd bond here. i have my radiant mint. Yeah. That's, that's, that's class. That's the hardest part about traveling is keeping your three ounce- liquids yes, and right? stuff stocked because i mean you go right. once and you use the lotion on you and you're done it's, yeah. it's over they made sure they had a fireproof quilt for actor lionel barrymore because he had a bad habit of fall asleep falling asleep while smoking in bed it's another cool thing <laughs> like i remember when i took jack baker to frank's mm -hmm. which was a new hot steakhouse for just a minute here in new york city i think the people who own the home, old homestead opened up frank's i'd stole a couple of knives from there as well and when Jack sat down, the waiter brought out the wine list directly to him with a pair of his reading glasses. Oh, that's that's mm. awesome. And he had reading glasses in all the restaurants Jack that he Bakers. liked all around the city. That's great. I don't know if Jack's still with us. Man, that was awesome. Fucking Jack Baker. I don't know. That's yeah, a good question. Um, by the way, Lionel Barrymore was a very accomplished actor, but you would probably be able to recognize him as being the great uncle of Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore's 
grandfather was John Barrymore, mm -hmm. and John Barrymore's brother was Lionel Barrymore. Lionel's a great name. Yeah, and Lionel Barrymore was the guy who used to fall asleep while smoking. Um, Richard Harris, the Irish actor who played Marcus Aurelius in the original Gladiator. I just watched the original Gladiator, and I realized that's it's Dumbledore. It's yeah, he's Dumbledore. also the, Dumbledore the first Dumbledore. Until he died, yeah. right? So they had to replace him with, I don't even know who replaced him. Um, so he's Dumbledore in the original Did Harry Potter movies. Did replace him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they had to um, have him replaced like mid season. Really? He was uh he's an actress who's extremely recognizable. I can't uh, actor. I can't come up with his name though. Um Vibs is on it though now. Yeah. So uh Mark Rylance. Yeah. Do you have a picture of him? Yeah. Just so there's no dead air. There it there is. It is. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So Richard Harris, the original Dumbledore and um Marcus Aurelius from the original Gladiator. He lived at the Savoy Hotel for like the last 10 years of his life, which is a pretty big flex. My, my friend George lived in the Drake Hotel in Chicago for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. He was extremely wealthy. You should so, try living in a hotel sometime. It's kind yeah, of that was you. And <laughs> when Richard like Harris, someone that did that. <laughs> Richard Harris um, was being taken out of the hotel in a stretcher before he died. And as he was taken out, it's kind of famous. The paparazzi was there and they said, what's the matter, Richard? And he said, it's the food meaning it's the food from the hotel, which obviously was a joke because it was one of the biggest gourmet uh, stops in London. Uh, back to the Savoy. My point is the place was legit, and this guy Caesar Ritz was a big reason for it. He was, he was a pioneer in the development and management of luxury hotels and knew how to entice wealthy customers. He was the first to mandate the customer is always right. That came from Caesar Ritz. His code was see all without looking, hear all without listening, be attentive without being servile, anticipate without being presumptuous, and if a diner complains about a dish or the wine, immediately remove it and replace it, no questions asked. So the term ritzy, if something is ritzy, it comes from Caesar Ritz. I'm assuming that's got to be where the cracker comes from too, but I just ran out of steam on that one. Yeah, But yeah. I mean, ritzy, that's like what? what is something that's vibsy? Like if somebody says, oh, you're staying, uh, you're going glamping large. Wow, what a ritzy weekend that is. What could I do that would be considered vibsy? It's like, well, I, I'm, the movie Kingpin. It's like you right. got Munson or whatever. Munson, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, vibsy. Yeah, I don't, I don't even. Think uh, about it. Because yeah, they yeah. used to say you got jeetered you after got, Jeter fucked you and gave you like a, they, he had like goodie bags, I think, made up for the girls. Like yeah, yeah, right. After what that was that was the rumor. After a one night stand, he'd have After he'd give you a up. gift bag. Yeah, he'd give oh. you a gift bag. Yeah. Like they were the award. And th and it's like, congrats, you just got jeetered. Mm. And and that's yeah. not true, obviously. Is there? What did you get, Annie? Oh, if you got a towel and it was hot from the dryer. Oh yeah, that's nice. I do that for everybody. All that's nice. Yeah, I love that. Uh, so this guy like Caesar that. Ritz was the end all be all. Ritzy came from it. The whole deal, like I had said. But he was fired, or as they say over there, sacked. Um, for fraud, he was implicated in the disappearance of more than 3,400 pounds worth of wine, which is $160,000 in today's money. So it was a lot of wine, as well as receiving kickbacks from suppliers. He never fought the accusations. He never fought the termination. Instead, he just went, opened up his own line of hotels, and those Caesar Ritz hotels eventually became known as the Ritz Carltons that we all know and love nowadays so the savoy hotel fired its manager his name was caesar ritz and that's the reason why we have ritz hotels ritz carltons and the like so that little factoid i threw out and now i just um i just did whatever yes the ritz cracker does come from the ritz carlton hotel look at that they're delicious aren't yeah. they i like them because they're a little bit well done around the edges yeah guy Chose, named, guy named right? what I was going to say, chose the name for the cracker in 1934 to evoke luxury and remind people of better times during the Great Depression. Ooh. Oh, shit. Yeah. Still a solid-ass thing to this day. Old Ritzy. Old Ritzy. <laughs> Old Ritzy. Somebody named One Forest One, which I think is kind of fun, saw that Diddy had to give back his key to New York City. You should take a left turn into those things. I'm assuming a left turn into those things aren't like Baby Oil and Diddy, I think it's going to be into Keys of the City, so that's what I'm going to do. Diddy was awarded the key to New York City in September of 2023 for being a role model. Oh. <laughs> Mayor Eric Adams declared the date to be Diddy Day. I wonder what he cited as those things. 
I, I mean, I guess he gives back to the community, and I guess if you're looking to get out of, you know, he was, I think he's a Harlem guy. But do you he? list them? Like, our son just won an award, and they listed all the things that he did to mm. win that award. Award? Do they actually say, did he did this, this, and that? Or do they just say, oh, you're a great guy. You you donated money. Like, is that is it just a money? No, I mean, I'm, like, I'm, Willie gives his time. Willie deserves a key. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. And we, we spoke about that in the last episode about how much he gives back to his community, particularly in the Bronx. But I think Diddy does do stuff on that level. But since September of 2023, a lot of shit has happened. And, you know, Eric Adams, the mayor, is under investigation. Yes, he is. And But Eric Adams, before he went under vacation, well, before he went under investigation, he had asked Diddy to return the key after the tape of Diddy in the towel beating the shit out of Cassie. Oh, that was rough. In the yeah. hotel thing? Yeah. So that was enough. So Diddy did return it about nine months later, all before all the baby oil shit, just for beating up Cassie. Mm. I, I don't know if I should say allegedly anymore because it was on tape, right? Yeah. yeah. I think it was pretty... Tape. Yeah. I think it was beyond... Um, what's that where they expire? Uh, statute of limitation. Yeah, right. I think no. it was beyond that. I, th- um, I could be wrong, but I think it was. Uh, Diddy got the key to the city to recognize his contributions to music, business, and philanthropy. There you, there go. you go. And now, so the guy who Thank gave you. the key to Diddy, Eric Adams, is being charged for allegedly soliciting bribes from foreign nationals to support his political campaigns and his personal travel. Ongoing investigation. Adams has said that he's not guilty, so he can't say anything with any kind of definitive nature right here. But if convicted, uh, Mayor Adams faces up to 45 years in prison. So a guy who's now looking down the barrel of perhaps a 45-year sentence gave the key to a guy who has 16,000 bottles of baby oil in his own Epstein Island, which we're Mm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, I said to myself, that's got to be the worst key to the city give ever it's got to be up there yeah it's nowhere near yeah it. yeah um what's a key to the city do absolutely nothing it used to mean something in medieval times major cities would have walls and gates around them for protection so a visiting hero or king would get a key as a sign of respect important merchants could also use their key to get in and out of certain kingdoms without having to pay a toll so a key to the city used to be something legit now it's just more of a I don't know, it's a paperweight or an ornament, right? But it's still an honor to receive, and I'm very open to receive one if anyone wants to. Mm -hmm. So New Yorkers regret regret giving theirs to Diddy. The city of Adelaide in Australia probably regrets that they gave one to Cher because she turned around and sold it on eBay Uh for $90,000. Sold the key to the city, which I don't know if I respect it or if she's a scumbag. Michael well, it Jackson was it worth ninety thousand or was it worth a whole lot more? <laughs> I don't know. Michael Jackson got awarded keys to both Chicago and Las Vegas. Maybe they regret that. Maybe not. But like Michael, obviously, is he's got that weird, like yeah. untouchable almost. He's bulletproof. Wait, it's was Michael Jackson him. convicted? No, no, not at all. But, but there's still a stink. Like that's my whole deal. Well, like R. Kelly, I'm sure has one. I could tell you right now, uh, Michael Vick was awarded the keys to Dallas in 2011 and then the keys to Atlantic City in 2013, both after all the dogfighting shit. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. You know what they're not getting? Uh. Giving him. He's not getting a bone to the city. Uh. Remember when Dave got the bone to the city in Miami? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sure the guys I work for have gotten keys to cities before. I could see that, right? Is that uh, maybe? Know. Who the hell knows? Who? But all of that stuff, Cher, Michael Jackson, um... Michael Vick, Diddy, Mayor Adams, they fail in comparison to Detroit, which in 1979 gave a key to the city to Saddam Hussein. No. Fucking wild. Why? Why? So, yeah, so in 1979, so for people who forget who Saddam Hussein is, <laughs> fucking shame on you. But Saddam Hussein was a big part of the news not too long ago. He was the fifth president of Iraq from 1979 to 2003. He's been accused of genocide multiple times. There's a group called the Human Rights Watch. They estimate that Saddam's regime was responsible for the murder or disappearance of anywhere from 250,000 to 300,000 Iraqis. Saddam Hussein was a murderous, scumbag, bad guy. 
He donated $250,000 to a church in Detroit, then donated another two hundred dollars afterwards for more improvements. So he donated a total of four hundred fifty dollars to this church in Detroit. Uh, the Sacred Heart Chaldean Church. Chaldean, I believe, is a branch of Christian, uh, Christianity that is practiced in and around like the Middle East. So, okay. yeah, and this church served uh, the largest population of Catholic Iraqis outside of the Middle East. And ironically, many of its members were only in the U.S. after fleeing Saddam's rule. But anyway, he gave this church a total of $450,000, and uh, they gave him the fucking key to the city. I'm sure he gave them a little more than that. I'm sure he gave them a nice stern warning, told them that they had to give it to him. <laughs> you know? yeah, no, I mean, and again, it's only ceremonial, but if you're going to have regrets, I'd rather give 10 was. to Diddy than give one to fucking Saddam Hussein. Yeah. That, like, that's bad. Yeah, that's like saying Albuquerque gave it to uh, Bin Laden. You know what I mean? Like it's sort of like that. Except Saddam Hussein probably killed a lot more people than Osama Bin Laden. Yeah. So you know, in a, in a, uh, directly or indirectly, uh, when asked for a comment, I could not read Saddam Hussein because he was convicted by the Iraqi High Tribunal of Crimes Against Humanity and sentenced to death by hanging on December thirtieth, two thousand six. Rest in absolutely no peace. You, you, uh, historical. Didn't they drag him through the town and they just show it on every TV? I, I don't know if it's him or uh, Muammar Gaddafi or whatever. Oh, no, I think but it they, was, they, I they, kind they... of remember being pregnant, sitting on the bed and flipping through the channels with Mick, and then all of a sudden, like they were dragging him around. That like, like they did stream Saddam Hussein's like hanging. Did, I remember right? like there being videos yeah. online if you wanted to check and it out. When they found him, they found they found him in a spider hole. Right. Mm -hmm. And yep. CNN oh, yeah, or somebody dropped that crude drawing of a six foot hole with a hatch and it said rubble fan clean air. Then it just had a body silhouette inside this hole. And that got memed. So mm -hmm. the Saddam Hussein, you know, spider hole meme, like people be like uh, rents in New York City <laughs> or they, you know, they would they, yep. it, it yep. got used all over the place. So Saddam Hussein was turned into a meme, but it was much more than that. And he had the key to Detroit sometimes can't catch a break. I will tell you right now, I like Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And Patty had shit on it once in a blog, and I saw the blog was in the pipeline. So I said, Patty, I'm going to defend Detroit, Michigan. Can you please not you know, release that till I release mine? So his went out at 1 o'clock and mine went out at 101, like right after his. He got roasted by the people of Detroit and beyond. Yeah. And I was lauded as a hero as I should be. <laughs> it's, you know it's, I mean? it's an easy target, I feel like. Yeah. There's a lot of good things about Detroit. A lot of shit things, too. Yeah. Saddam Hussein being one of them. Yeah. But I think the city itself, particularly is one area, that's that's very nice. So I'm pro-Detroit here. I don't have any Pistons wear or anything like that, but still. Yeah, yeah, Pistons stink. But um, no, it's it, Detroit's kind of like an Indianapolis. It's a Midwest, you know. Yeah. A lot more factories and stuff in Detroit than that. But. You know who I was talking to last week? I was in Arizona for that uh, Barstool Classic. Uh, Riggs' is dad. Yeah. He's a real Midwest guy. He's yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit. I, I met him one time, and I was just like, this is... this. this he's is, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And he's a big historian. Mm -hmm. Like, we were talking about Kansas, Missouri, and how there are people from Kansas that Missouri people think is like a genocidal maniac and there's statues of him and, and vice versa really? you know what i mean yeah um a anyway it was uh, it was a pleasure talking to him yeah. a lot more than his son yeah i, I, oh, I, I believe not a blow up a spot but i believe he's an orthodontist he Might just be. he was just your classic just like midwest dad loves history very successful just yes like a good dude to talk to very proud of his son oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. it that. was very very nice to see dentists are the best like they're just uh, kind of like yeah great people right like if you, I, I agree I will tell you on one other thing, that Barstool Classic, I, I don't have to tell you to sign up for it because it might even be too late. That gets sold out in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. And so if you, I was introducing golfers and stuff on the microphone, even though they're from Washington State, they had to qualify in Louisville. Like, they'll fly all around the country trying to get into the qualifier to get into the final. I was lucky enough to go out there and experience the final in um, Scottsdale, and uh and it was wonderful. We are at Greyhawk Golf Club, the Talon and Raptor courses. It is a top-notch thing from top to I don't give Barstool a lot of credit. 
That is a top-notch thing from top to bottom. Scottsdale, it sounds great. I went to Fredericksburg, Maryland. <laughs> <Did you? laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, is that your stop on it? That was my stop. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah. But it, I mean, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous day, gorgeous weather. It was the summer, so it wasn't yeah. like it was, yeah. But the guy, so they play desert rules out at this course because of, they say, rattlesnakes. And I was like, oh, it's kind of bullshit maybe. But I had seen a couple of coyote, and one of the other guys who was playing saw uh, Hyavina, like those wild pigs. Oh, I forget what the hell they're called. And yeah, stuff. a lot of shit going on. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So you saw the uh, what did you say? You saw the Road Runner right when you saw. Oh, the- I saw Road Runners right before I saw a Coyote. I was like, oh, you just missed it. Yeah, <laughs> you know jealous. what I mean? I'm yeah, jealous. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Uh, number you sent me a letter that Winston Churchill received from his dad when he was younger. Thank you. So we're big fans of Winston Churchill on this podcast. I think if you had to rank it, Vibsy is probably the number one fan of Winston Churchill, followed by Andy Love and then me. Um, but he was a. Uh, He's, if you don't know who Saddam Hussein is, you don't know who Winston Churchill, is, Winston Churchill is. We've talked about him a dozen times. He was the prime minister of the UK during World War II from 1940 to 1945. And then again from 1951 to 1955. More importantly, in the Twisted History of Drunks, we told you how in his lifetime he might have drank 42,000 bottles of Paul Roger. He burned through 10 cigars every goddamn day and lived to the ripe age of 90. My favorite story is when he was on tour in America. He had asked the woman who was taking his order for breast meat, and she corrected him. She said, uh, you either ask for white meat or dark meat. He hated being corrected, so the next day he sent her an orchid corsage with a note that said, I would be obliged if you put this flower on your white meat. That's yeah. nice, and I heard you. I big, think that big was naturals. Big naturals. Oh, oh, baby. He had swinging <laughs> naturals, and he was just like, fuck you. I like the story where he did the wrong sign when he... Yeah. Oh, instead of up, the big, up yours. Yeah, yeah he did yeah. this instead of the victory sign. Um, his mother was from Brooklyn. Put that in the books. She may or may not have been part Iroquois, and she may or may not have invented the Manhattan. And it's it's been known to be untrue that she didn't invent the Manhattan, but I like running with that anyway. Listen, this is a history podcast, and we check a lot of shit. Today, we're just going to talk about what people wrote in. So, you know, if you want to go all view on us, please do and fact check it, and I'll rescind some stuff, but otherwise I'm just having fun with it. Uh, Winston Churchill's mom was rumored to have named the Manhattan because it's the only drink that she drank when she yep. came here, but it wound up, it was made at a bar, I think called Manhattan. Um, she had snake tattoos. Yeah. Sick. That's awesome. Yeah. But his dad was kind of a scumbag. Oh. And is fucking weird looking. Look at that picture I put in of him. I saw that, but this is a great letter. Yeah. He was the right Honorable Lord Randolph Churchill, and he looks like a right Ugh. Honorable Lord Randolph Churchill. He was a British politician, kind of a legend. He died at the age of 45 while being treated for syphilis. I just like to throw that in. Classic. For Winston. Probably got it from the mom. For young for I mean, young Winston. Was... Yeah, she had remarried afterwards. She's had a couple of husbands. Um, contact with his world famous father was sporadic. It's reported that he never ate dinner with his parents until he was a teen, and then only on rare occasions. You know, so he was a nanny guy, as we all know. Um, makes fucked up kids. As a young man, Winston was thrilled when he was accepted into Sandhurst Military College. Although a public college, and not the same as his dad's alma mater, which was a private cavalry school known as the 60th Rifles. Sounds like a pretty fucking cool school, to be quite honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was nonetheless prestigious and quite an honorable accomplishment for young Winston, and he eagerly, eagerly awaited his dad's favor And on hearing the news that his son had gotten into this prestigious college that wasn't 60th Rifles, where Lord Randolph had gone, he had sent his son the following letter. People who are... Ladder? I'm I'm fucked up. Sent them this letter. For people who are parents, you know how important it is to have that mixture of positive and negative reinforcement. If you don't want your kid to grow up to be a vegan serial killer, you can't all be negative, 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 right? But you can't also be their fucking best friend, so there's a gentle balance. Lord Randolph didn't know that shit. He had no, uh, he had, <laughs> he didn't know what the fuck he was doing, probably. Bit of this, a hard ass? Oh, this is what he wrote to his son. He had syphilis. You should be ashamed <laughs> of your slovenly, happy-go-lucky, harem scarum style of work. Never have I received a really good report of your conduct from any headmaster or tutor. Always behind, incessant complaints of a total want of application to your work. You have failed to get into the 60th Rifles, 
the finest regiment in the army. You have imposed on me an extra charge of some 200 pounds a year. Do not think that I'm going to take the trouble of writing you long letters after every failure you commit and undergo. I no longer attach the slightest weight to anything you may say. (laughs) If you cannot prevent yourself from leading the idle, useless, unprofitable life you have had during your school days, you will become a mere social waste, one of the hundreds of public school failures, and you will degenerate into a shabby, unhappy, and futile existence. You will have to bear all the blame for such misfortunes. Your mother sends her love. Yeah, that's, Lord a, Winston that's, Churchill. that's a great that's, line. That's exactly what he sent to. And that's not tongue-in-cheek. That's a, This guy, Winston Churchill, was very, very... <laughs> Uh, like he became something. He's an iconic for yeah. So the thing. Well, let me ask you this: Who knows the dad's name? I mean, a lot of people would. I, but yeah, compared to his son, you're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, this kind of this might be why he stood up to the Nazis. He was like so angry, and he's like, oh, "We right? got to fight. We got to fucking fight." Prime Minister twice. That's what we were talking about last night. It's and, what and, made him who he was. And it and it wasn't perfect. Like, there's a lot of people who are detractors or um, critics of some of Winston Churchill's your policies and whatnot, but you can't deny the guy was a fucking stud. Without a doubt. And I love the fact that I have his dad saying, I no longer attach the slightest weight to anything you may say. Meanwhile, a country hang on hung on every word when he was fighting the Nazis. It sounds like a conversation between you and my dad. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I just love how he just goes in on him and then he's like, Oh by the way, your mom says hi. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mom says hi. Uh, let's take a break for Simply Safe. If you're ever worried about the safety of your home and family, there's a there's no better time to act. Right now, you can get 60% off a new Simply Safe security system. Their best deal of the year. Simply Safe is the home security to trust. Listen, you can go on TikTok today and get like a camera or whatnot, but that's all you're getting. <laughs> like people think that their home is secure just because they essentially tape their cell phone to their front door, and it's just not true. Old school systems only take action once someone is already inside your home, and that's too late. Simply Safe's Active Guard Outdoor Protection changes the game by preventing crimes before it even happens. If someone's lurking around or acting suspiciously, those agents see them in real time. Talk to them directly, set off your spotlights, or even call the police before they've had a chance to break in. Simply Safe is offering my listeners, our listeners, exclusive early access to their Black Friday sale. This week only, you can get 60%, 60% of any new system with a select professional monitoring plan. That's their best offer of the year. So head to simplysafe.com slash twisted. That's Simply Safe, S I M P L I S A F E dot com slash twisted. There is no safe like Simply Safe. Uh, the next one is from a kid named Justin Elzey after we did a segment on regional dialects. Remember when we were doing like pecan? Oh, that was fun. I yeah. love that. Yeah, one. yeah. And you were decidedly more Southern and you were perfectly Midwestern. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, it was and a Southern bell. just kind of yeah. happened. There's fuzzes falling down from here, by the way. That's yeah. asbestos. Anybody else getting it? Oh. <laughs> we talked about how we tend to call soft drinks in New York City soda versus pop, right? And, uh, you know, a bunch of things like that. Or how we just simply call them Cokes. You think like, that's Coke? regional? You don't think that's the fact that it's not the 1950s? It was. Ex- it's extremely regional because I actually looked into it a little bit after uh, Justin had sent this. Hey, Large, I hope you and the Twisted History crew are doing well. I'm from the suburbs of New Orleans, and I wanted to educate you on what we call soft drinks down here. In New Orleans and the surrounding areas, we refer to soft drinks as cold drinks. Huh. It doesn't matter if the drink is actually cold or not. A common phrase you will hear down here is, I have some cold drinks, but they're hot. Meaning, I think, if you had Cokes, but you haven't put them on ice yet. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Uh, I know it sounds goofy. Also, you should run this by Mincy to see if it's an entire NOLA thing or just a black community. Oh, okay, so this dude's a black guy. Big fan of the show and all the work you, St. Ann, Vibs, and John do, reminding us how twisted history really is, uh, signed Justin Elsie. I did what he said. I reached out to Mincy. I should read this. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I love him. I There is no Ben Mintz slander on this show. No. Is there poking fun of Ben Mintz every now and again? 100%. But I love the fucking guy. So I hit Mincy, and I said uh, to him just like this. <laughs> Uh, bu- bu- bu. Brother, I have a question. Growing up, what did you call soft drinks like soda and whatnot? A twisted listener told me New Orleans refers to soft drinks as cold drinks. Have you ever heard of such a thing? This is what he sends you back. Are you going to read it like him? Please yeah, do, because I impression. love him. One weird thing is they call grocery shop and making groceries. Didn't answer the question at all. <laughs> yeah. like, like, I said, cool. 
but have you heard of soft drinks being referred to as cold drinks? Even if they're warm on the shelves, wherever you make groceries, like I brought that in. He's so um, cute. But they're still called cold drinks. And he took a little while to get back to me, not that he needs to have me on speed dial, but he did send back, I don't think so. So it's not something that yeah. uh, he wanted. And then he got a line on a Mardi Gras parade for me and you <laughs> to go to. He's so on cute. The thing. Uh, he's, 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 oh, yeah, he's probably getting ready for hogs. So right after him. I'll get that text next week. I had hit uh, Megan. Because oh, Megan's yeah, yeah, from down sure. there. And I said, uh, what up, Queen? I have a question. Growing up, what did you... Uh, Megan making money. She's also in the Chicago office, and she's wonderful. Growing up, what did you call soft drinks like soda? A Twisted History listener, so I told him. Have you ever... Served? I asked Mincy as well. Yeah, cold drinks are definitely a Southern thing. It's either that or Coke. No matter what carbonated beverage, it's either cola or a cold drink. Megan making money. Down, with the, make down money. with the culture. Yeah, absolutely. So... I love her. For the record, soft drink is probably the right term for this. Soft drink is the right term because, by definition, a soft drink is a beverage that typically contains water, often carbonated water, a sweetener, and a flavoring agent. That's everything. That's everything outside of, like, milk-based drinks and juices, right? I like how you have a little bit of snack mix all over you. Sorry. Perfect. Like, saving it a little bit for later. I love it. <laughs> um, soft I drinks love may snacks. also contain caffeine, colorings, preservatives, and other ingredients. That casts a very wide net. So, by definition, everything that we drink, basically, when you go to a restaurant that's not booze, is probably a soft drink, right? Uh, but Justin is 100% right. Outside of Megan, I looked it up, and cold drink is the phrase of choice in New Orleans and most of East Texas. And while I was there, I also learned this. In rural parts of Arkansas, they call it soda water. And some even more rural parts, they call it sody water. I like that. Can I get me a sody water? A sody pot. I'm going to call yeah. it that from now. I like I that. Fucking I love like that. giving things nicknames. It should be soft drinks. Like Spamones or yeah, yeah. GJs. I love giving nicknames. You got any sody, sody water, water up in this bitch? There's got any sodies? I did a, a, a man on the street in Times Square when I first got to New York, and there was a, a crazy guy that said, like, sody, sody pop or something like that. And I was like, oh, he's just a crazy person. No, it's just like it's a Texas Arkansas. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, all right. He's a transplant. Next one is from Ryan Bruak. For the next Twisted History of Listener Submissions, which is this, I would love to hear you talk about the finding of chiropractic care. Oh, gosh. So I'm going to use the word chiropractic care for a little bit. Is there a better word for it? Is it just like oh, no. what is the what is the art of? It's just called chiropractic. Right? Bone doctor. Yeah, but <laughs> like, but I was this is and I mean no disrespect, but it's going to come out disrespectful. I was always told that they're not really doctors. Right. I don't. I've never like you're going to get to the bottom of it. I would assume. But if I you work with anesthesia, system. you study anesthesiology. Right. If you work as a dentist, you study dentistry. Mm. Um, if you work as a chiropractor, you study and, and chiropractorology. Yeah. It's yeah. chiropractic, and yeah. that's it. But yeah. it doesn't sound right medicine. to me. Right. So I might be calling it chiropractic care. So I will. I'll talk about it. Daniel um, Ryan Bruek is the guy who sent it in. He gave me a couple of topics surrounding the father of chiropractic care. This guy, Daniel David Palmer, D.D. Palmer. But before I get to that, what are our thoughts on chiropractors? I grew up the way Ann did, I think, where I thought it was like just like a make-believe thing. But then I, uh, like a at masseuse, a fine... Like a glorified would, masseuse, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I went to a fine, fine institution, IUPUI, where I took a class on like medicine and stuff. And yeah, it, it, I think it's a science that came along a little later. Yeah. But it was definitely practical and, and based in science, and it's a, a real thing. Yeah, they don't have medical doctor degrees. No, no. Like, and my whole thing is I've always, I'm very jealous of, it's usually a girl with huge boobs and she goes to these guys and they put the microphone on her back, yep. but when he snaps her, it pops. They do it with dogs now too. Yeah. Like the guy does it where he adjusts like pit bulls and yeah, shit. Was, yeah. I'm absolutely fucking fascinated with it and it's all over my timeline and I got so jealous of it. I was talking with Nick Mangold. We were hanging out, and I was saying how my hips are fucked up because my one... Remember I told you I spent a year in bed? Yes. I just told you that? Yeah. So my one leg is shorter than the other because I broke this leg here, 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 and here. My tibia and fibula are two places each. Compound went through the skin. So this leg didn't grow as long as the other one. Fraction of an inch. But still, my hips are never aligned because of it. It's the only thing yep. that's... And so Nick was like, you need to go and get your hips realigned. Mm. He's like, I have something similar... 
and I used to do it after and all the other treatments that I'd gotten. But once somebody had like realigned my hips, it was, you know, life changing for me. Future Hall of Famer. So I went I went to a chiropractor and I went through the whole thing and the guy started me on a regimen where I'd go in like twice a week. And I went in the first time. You go and you get the hot compresses, mm-hmm. you listen to some music, you lay down. And then he goes and he does the adjustment. And it was pretty cool. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I loved hearing the pop and stuff. Yeah. The second time he did it, um, it was later that week, and he popped my rib when he was adjusting my... Uh, so they adjust your lower back, up by your shoulders, and then like your mid-back area. Mid-lumbar? I don't know. And when he did it, he popped my rib, and he fucked me up. Yeah. He fucked me up. So bad. I've, I mean, I couldn't breathe in. I couldn't... And the thing is, you sign away your life on that. I don't mean there was to no laugh, fucking it was liability. Really bad. It was. I'm telling you, Vibsy. You never have luck with. I mean, the last time you went to one before. <laughs> Gee, fucked. Oh, the one I went to before that was a holistic you one. You were so insulted. Who strummed my buttocks to get my chi? That was a weird thing. But this guy was legit, and I thought that we could have like a long relation. But now I'm afraid <laughs> to go back. Yeah, Not I've, I've heard horror stories of like someone just having a bad bad experience. I go to a guy every like. Every every other week, not right. he doesn't really realign me, but just just talking about muscles and how everything works and how you can adjust shit and all that. Yeah, they yeah. run like that thing so they can see where which muscles are pulling on what side. So I yeah, I guess I, they could really have the study of chiropractic is the study of nervous system, the spine, and how they relate to the rest of the body. And it's because and listen, it's because of D.D. Dee Dee Palmer, and I'm going to tell you about the father of chiropractic. And he was he was crazier than shit house rat. Yeah. But the idea is bonded. So this is not a uh, attacking chiropractors. No. And I don't I'm, mean to laugh at you, but I, you have oh, never no, had. I mean, I've been laughing at you for thirty years, but you have never had a good experience going to the chiropractor. There's a barstool fan who's a chiropractor who's coming to the office. Doctor Tom Kern. That's who I go to. He's a good oh, okay. man. Really? He's a good man. We're debating yeah. on whether you I've were, never gone to him because he's should. in the city. Yeah. He's, like you right. know what I mean. Uh, yeah. So, but he's like, I'll come into the office. I should probably revisit that because, uh, you know, I'm I'm not as gun shy because it's been over a year since this one doctor popped my fucking rib. Yeah. I'm telling you, Vibsy, it was, it was. And he was mad you didn't come back. Remember? No, no, he was like, What did you don't say? say? He knows who I work for. I would never blow the guy's spot up. It was a 100 percent accident. I'm very big. No, there was another yeah. right, like, like the person and I was 50 pounds heavier then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. so on those little tables. Like, I'm inadvertently hanging out, you know what I mean? And when he did, he just fucking, maybe I'm, I'm osteo- yeah. osteoporotic, too. I don't know no, if I have weak bones, no. but he fucked me. Yeah. No. no. It, it, yeah. But one time they called and they were upset. Remember, they were like, you're not coming back. Then there had to be one in between. Yeah, no, they. I think they were upset that I wasn't coming back, but then I explained to him why, and he oh. was like, call off the dogs. Because you sign up for so many things, and when I called back and I said, listen, this is what's happening, I'm not... I'm not getting litigious. I'm not blowing up your spot on Barstool or anything like that. But, you know, I paid for stuff. Mm-hmm. Do not fucking charge me. Right. And they didn't. Right. And I oh. paid for like so many down the road. I was like, do not. Just don't fucking charge me and stop calling me. Yeah. And he's like, I totally understood. I apologize. If there's anything, I'd be willing yeah, to do whatever ha- you happens. want. He's like, come back. I'll make it all better. I was like, I can when I can breathe again. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was bad. I felt bad. Oh, I had to cancel the fucking kickball thing. I had to do the celebrity <laughs> kickball down in Charlotte. I right. couldn't play because I couldn't you, fucking move. You had a broken rib. Yeah, yeah. And the, well, the year before you had Bruce an issue rib, too. Crack. Yeah. yeah I, I, I've had some issues. <laughs> what did you do? I don't know what to talk about. Less. Daniel David Palmer. Okay. Apologies so to Corey LaJoy. He's the grandfather of chiropractic care. He was born in Canada but moved to the U.S. when he was 20. He was a firm believer in alternative medicine. He opposed anything he thought to be associated with mainstream medicine, such as vaccinations. Instead, believing that the human body had an ample supply of natural hearing, healing power transmitted through the nervous system, which centers around the spine. He did not believe in traditional medicines, including vaccines, like I said, and is quoted as saying during a smallpox outbreak, it is the very height of absurdity to strive to protect any person from smallpox or any other malady by inoculating them with a filthy animal poison. Yeah. That's like some fucking ghost of Fauci yeah. shit going on. I, right? went, I, I went to the doctor for the first time in a very long time, but the guy was like, uh, you want to get your flu shot? And I was like, nah, I'm good. I don't really... He don't never really, gets it. I don't really do that. Yeah, I never get it. And the never. guy's like, well, these are tested. And I was like, brother, I'm not like an anti-vaxxer. I just no. am too lazy to get it. Like, I just don't want to do it. I don't want to deal with it. And I think maybe if we don't get them as often as we should... 
maybe I always get sick when I get it. You, right. That's yeah. I and I, I just don't want to have to do that because I never really get sick. So yeah. Why? Why, why the fuck? Yeah. Why fuck with it? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't gotten the kids flu shots in ages because they all got the like the one strand a one year. And then the B flu or whatever it was was what was getting everybody, and mm. everybody was sick at the same time. I said never again. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. it's not worth it. It doesn't, it didn't work for us. Instead of traditional medicine and vaccines and medicines and all that kind of shit, he suggested that if any part of the body was affected with an illness, it was merely because it wasn't receiving the normal nerve supply because of a spinal misalignment. And a chiropractic readjustment of the spine was the most effective way of realigning that spinal delivery system to reestablish that supply. So he thought the spine had all the feel-good juice in it, and the reason some parts of your body didn't feel good is because the line to that feel-good juice provider, the spine, was cut off in some way. So by readjusting the spine, feel-good juice gets to your liver, cancer is cured. I believe that. You know why? When you work out after you haven't worked out for a long time, I think you release toxins that are in there somewhere, and it sure, makes you sick. Are, yeah. Oh, oh. Makes you because sick. if you if you haven't worked out, if you notice someone goes back to the gym after a while, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they go to the gym, and they're almost within a week immediately sick. And they're like, oh, I, you know, I just got back into it, and now I got sick, and I don't, you know, I'm wondering if I'm going to feel up to going back once I'm better. And I think there's something to, like, in the reverse That's of what you said. I don't go to the gym. <laughs> no, but I'm, well, I'm you know, so if you're if you haven't worked out in a while, I wasn't, go to the gym and see if you come down with the flu in a week or don't. He was also a spiritist. That's not a That's spiritualist. Fun. He's a spiritist, which and he said he received his a spiritist means that uh, you believe in like reincarnation. Okay. And he believed in uh, oh, the ability to drink talk. a lot of spirits. No, no, and he believed that he could talk to spirits. So seances, <laughs> oh. Ouija boards, that's all spiritist type yeah, shit. Brother. I thought he did right, right. shots in between yeah. patients. So D.D. Palmer, the father of chiropractic care, said he received chiropractic from the other world, from a deceased medical physician named Jim Atkinson. So he got it in a vision. Hmm. That's, that's that, fun. He's yeah. fun at a holiday. He was married six times, had a handful of kids. His son, B.J. Palmer was the most outspoken and said his father, he resented the way his father treated his family, stating that his father beat three of his children with straps and was so much involved in chiropractic that he hardly knew he had any children. You fast forward a bit, and in 1913, 68-year-old Dee Dee Palmer, the father, was marching on foot in a local parade while his 31-year-old son, B.J. Palmer, was driving in the parade directly behind him. Didi, the dad, was struck by the car that BJ was driving, and he died in a Los Angeles, California hospital two months later. Damn. So he goes to the hospital after being hit by a car that his son was driving, and he dies two months later. The official cause of death was typhoid fever, but many believe Didi's death was the consequence of his injuries from being hit by that car that was being driven by his son, who resented his father. He so, just kind of heal himself? When, yeah, so chiropractic, care was founded by an anti-vaxxer who learned his method from a dead spirit before his son ran him over and killed him so that yeah, that, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah that's, all right maybe not questions. the best yeah uh but whenever i learned about maybe it was like bone setting is what we learned about just like making sure everything's like lined up yeah. and everything's in the right place and which makes sense but this guy's a fucking i bought it the other day piece it's of shit ch chart of where to touch your feet if your spleen hurts, it was right? I've seen things. those. Yeah, like there are people. They got them at, at the the yeah. the rubbing tugs. Oh, I think yeah. body shot. Well, I'm sure they do. I bet they're. I bet they're really good at them. You have, well, You see they, them in my thing. I bought a tens machine that mat that sets up to the electrical impulses, and it's just two thing things on my your feet. Legs go back and I sit forth. down. I put my feet on it. It kind of sends the shocks through. Oh yep. no no no! I'm thinking the thing that shakes your feet. Oh <laughs> no! I have one of those too. I buy a lot of shit. You, yeah, you walk by like one of those like family family massage places, and yeah. they have it in the window. Like this is like yeah yeah. And even phrenology, I think, is they they say this parts of your head. So massaging this mm -hmm. all of a sudden releases pressure on your gallbladder oh, you're or some bullshit. Come here. Yeah, yeah. Or somebody grabs you. <laughs> oh, you can't take a dump? And they do that, and all of a sudden you shit your pants. Yeah. There's something to it, a little bit. So we're not shitting on chiropractic care because of how it had started. And the reason we're not doing that is because we're intelligent people who know that Coca-Cola started as a headache cure, and it was chock full of cocaine. Cocaine... 
Coca-Cola was introduced in 1886. It wasn't fully cocaine-free until the 1920s. So that means there was a good 30-some-odd year block of Coke being filled with Coke. I think I would have really here liked for it. that soft drink. Coke, Coke, great for headaches. Yeah, good, so deep. Yeah, good cold drink. Um, <laughs> Play-Doh was a wallpaper cleaner. That's what Play-Doh was invented to do. So you can rub on your wallpaper to take out stains. I used to love licking it. And I love Play-Doh, right? Even though that's not for its Play-Doh original Play-Doh either? Thing. I wasn't Play-Doh, I was a chapstick eater. Uh, I smell it, uh, cherry chapstick. I used to love licking Play-Doh. As soon as it came out, you just stick your tongue yeah. to it. <laughs> that's why I get cherry dip ice cream cones from uh, Dairy Queen, because it reminds me of what the chapstick should have tasted like yeah. back <laughs> in the day. No, it's just a way. Chapstick does look good. It's like the like a bar of like uh, yeah zest the cherry soap. One you're talking like, about, I gotta right? have uh, it. The cherry one, I gotta have. Yeah, he wouldn't lick just like the clear one. <laughs> the gap that we nice. all know. The yeah. gap the bottle. Remember the bottle cap? You used to eat those, the wax bottles. Yeah. The gap was founded by Donald and Doris Fisher in San Francisco, and it was a record store, a record store that also sold jeans. So I can understand. In 1968, there was a Dr. Spencer Silver. He was researching a way to develop a super strong adhesive for the outside of airplanes, but he accidentally did the exact opposite and invented a weak adhesive that stuck lightly without bonding tightly to just about any surface. And that's how Post-its were born. So we know that things start as something and become something different. So I know that chiropractic care is very good right now, even though one guy fucked me up, but it comes from very dubious origins yeah. including dd and bj um right that's probably the, the easiest way to say it yeah yeah so don't come at me chiropractors uh Doc- but you got a fucked up founder dr tom <laughs> kern i trust him with my life yeah and yeah and he, he's a very nice guy he's great guy he's on lower in the bar we did an episode of him came in he i wasn't every- there that day i when think pop box right yeah was it mincy someone farted oh. someone got their back popped and they just ripped ass oh. and it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's i'm glad i was out that day happens all the time because yeah, yeah, I watched yeah. those videos. And so, like, they put these people in pretzels, and all of a sudden they'll gas as it's happening. But yeah. so one of the things I was afraid of yeah, when I was yeah. getting done. Uh, you know, that, would, that would kill me. The dog the dog chiropractor videos are wild. I, I can't like, watch I can't how, watch any of them. He you know, loves he, them. Like, and how does the dog not, like, bite you? Like He's fearless. Yeah. It's like big mastiffs. And he's right up on him like full Nelson. And, yeah. and then when the dog goes like this, he turns around and kisses him on the nose. You know, he's yeah. very, very What's, good. I don't know. I, I just, love it. my jury's out on that. Next one's from Chris Allen. This isn't a good one. Uh, he said, a friend of mine is the curator of the Scottsboro Boys Museum. A lot of Easter eggs built into that case would be a great topic for a twisted episode. That's from Chris Allen. I never heard of the Scottsboro Boys Museum. Scottsboro, where is that? Scottsboro, Alabama. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I never heard of the museum. I never heard of the boys. I don't know why the fuck the boys got their own museum, yeah. and they deserve a lot more than it. Like I, That's 100% my ignorance. Yeah. You know, because we talk about travesties all the time mm-hmm. when we talk about civil rights. Listen, I'm fully aware of how the United States was a terrible place. I love the United States. I'm fully aware of how terrible we were to people of color for a very long time. And we've used a couple of those uh, situations here, like Emmett Till and whatnot. Mm-hmm. This was a fucking bad one. Yeah. Yeah. We're going down a dark path right now. I'm going to give it to you. Okay. Uh, do, do, do. The museum's, uh, f- so it's three hours from uh, Tuscaloosa. So if we were down visiting Mick, you can get to right. Scottsboro in about a three-hour drive. Uh, the museum's focus on the Scottsboro Boys case, which involved nine young African-American men falsely acclu- accused in 1931, okay, so almost 100 years ago, of raping two white women while hoboing aboard a freight train. Let's talk about hoboing. Hobos. Do you know oh. the difference? There's a small difference between them. I read the whole difference last week just for mm-hmm. out of coincidence. There's a lot of different meanings for a lot of different. Yeah. Movies. What are you asking the difference between a hobo and like a homeless person? A hobo. Ho- I'll, hobos I'll, I'll hobos ride better. the rails. A hobo, a tramp, and a bum. Don't look. Uh, yeah. There's a difference between a hobo, a tramp, and uh, a bum. If they're yeah, the hobos are, are the, the high society. They're the top of the food chain in, in the in the in the bum world. They are. Uh, tramp tramps are are, are are like a like a whore. Uh, yeah. You know what? Tramp did move over to be whore. Like, they used to be called jumpalines until your mom got on one. Now yeah. the trampoline. Like, you know, that old yeah, joke. Yeah. But tramps, in general, what it was, was all three rode the rails. That's like, so you when you'd find 
people riding the rails illegally. It was either a hobo, a tramp, or a bum. Hobos were willing to work, so they would travel from place to place on the rails and work whenever they could. Whenever they could. Yeah. Tramps also traveled the rails and did some work, but avoided work as much as possible. And bums never travel and never work. You know what I mean? Yeah. So bums, you kind of see here in New York, they don't like to use the word bum here. They use homeless or disenfranchised, whatever the fuck it is. They're bums. What is it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, with, without home or something, something like that. that. Yeah, yeah. They, I, you know, it's unfortunate. But a hobo, to Vibs's point, was top of the food chain because oh. they were often going places to try and get work, like even seasonal stuff. They'd get down, you know, to do stuff during harvest time and whatnot. So back to the Scottsboro boys. Nine black kids are riding the rails as hobos. They didn't know each other necessarily. I'm going to tell you about these nine black kids. Haywood Patterson was 18 years old. He claimed that he rode the rails so much that he could light a cigarette on the roof of a moving train. That's a pretty big fucking flex. Yeah. I like Haywood Patterson. Uh, Clarence Norris was the oldest. He was 19. He left behind 10 brothers and sisters in rural Georgia. Charlie Weems was also 19. Brothers Andy Wright and Roy Wright were 19 and 12. They were leaving home for the first time. There was a kid named Olin Montgomery. He was nearly blind, and he was actually a hobo because he was saving up uh, money to get a pair of glasses. Ozzy Powell was 16. William Robertson was 16. He suffered from severe syphilis and could barely walk. And Eugene Williams was 13. So of those nine teenagers, only four knew each other prior to boarding the train. So this is what happened to the Scottsboro boys. They get on the train and they're hoboing. They encounter a group of white hobos who decide to fuck with one or two of them, throwing rocks at them and trying to throw them off the train physically. So the black guys all banded together and they beat up the white guys. That's what's happened. They didn't fuck with them first, but they got a little, they gave more. Yeah. Right? Sort of like Biz outside of the Houstons, right? Um, so they get collectively into a fight with uh, white homos, hobos. I just <laughs> call them homos. Sorry about that. Um <laughs> So that's it. So they get to the next station. The white kids get off, find a police officer, and say they were attacked by blacks. This is 1930s. This is Alabama, right? But that's the first lie. They weren't attacked by blacks, but anyway. The they'll, cops... they'll, they'll take their time coming to a decision and, yes. and really <laughs> yeah. sort out the details. Yeah, really go through it. Um, the cops go onto the train. They say to the other police officers, round up every black youth riding the rails. So they go through every car. There's two white women who are also hoboing, and those white women, when the cops had come on the thing, had then said that the black kids raped them. Another lie. Yeah. He said, so the second lie. It was later surmised those women may have told the police that they were raped to divert police attention from themselves because they were both suspected of being prostitutes. And not only risked being arrested for prostitution, they risked being arrested for the Man Act which is uh, crossing state lines for immoral purposes. Mm. That was another big one back there. So to save their skin, these two white girls said, oh, yeah, those violent blacks, they also raped us. And that was a killable offense back then. More people were lynched. The only other thing people were lynched for more in the Deep South was murder. And the second was rape because it was almost an instant string them up. Not that they were guilty of rape or guilty of murder, right. but I'm just saying those were the charges levied against them with unfair trials, and that's what made them find the end of a rope. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Fucking awful, right? So these nine kids, eight of them were found guilty by all white juries in Scottsboro, Alabama, and immediately sentenced to death. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. Awful. So they weren't given any of the uh, rights that we have as Americans, the right to a uh, fair trial, a jury of their peers, there was no black people on the thing, and representation, it sucked representation, and it was pushed through very quickly. So all that was denied to them, right? And again, 1931 Alabama, this is 20 years before Emmett Till was murdered. This is 25 years before Rosa Park refused to go to the back of the bus or the Little Rock Nine uh, decided to go to school. Things were fucking bad back then. The teens grew into men while enduring decades of courtroom trials, convictions, re retrials, and incarceration. Even after one of the women admitted they made up the rape claim to avoid getting in trouble with the police. I think there should be jail time for women that do that, like big time. Collectively... None of them were put to death. Collectively, the Scottsboro boys spent a total of 130 years in Alabama jails and prisons for crimes that they did not commit. 130 That's years. Crazy. They, yeah. ruined, they ruined them. And over the ensuing decades, 
each of the 18s, so I said eight of nine were convicted because one of them was 13. That kid didn't get convicted. So over the ensuing decades, eight of the 18s were released from prison, but that false rape accusation effectively derailed their lives forever. Some returned to prison, others suffered health problems, violence, suicide, and early deaths. Honestly, and that's what this museum is about. It's paying homage to those nine boys, eight of them who had gone through a little bit more hell than the other kid. And uh, and it's worthwhile because there were trial after trial, landmark case after landmark case that brought some of this you know stuff into um, focus. Probably was the inadvertent beginning of the civil rights movement. Very, very important. I never heard of it. That's why I'm very, very happy that this dude, what the hell was his name? Chris Allen mm-hmm. had sent this in for me. I feel better mm-hmm. uh, for it. So, um, Similar to, to the Central Park Five? Central mm-hmm. Park the, Five, the, the yeah. Burns documentary about that? So fucking mm-hmm. many of them that we've heard, whatever, but I've never heard of Scottsboro Boys. In November of 2013, the Alabama Board of Pardons and Paroles granted posthumous pardons to the boys. Why even fucking bother? It was over 80 years after the incidents didn't occur. I, was I think about they say do the that more occurred. for themselves. I yeah. think the person who has the chance to do it does it because it's just so disgusting it's that somebody... 80 years did it 80 later. 80 years ago. And it's 25 years after the last of the Scottsboro boys had died. Mm-hmm. So nobody was around to fucking no, have a clean record. It's When you see what those scars on history... If you you'll, you'll do whatever I think there are some people out there who will do whatever they can to try and just correct a wrong and I don't I, you know I don't fault them for it yeah but it's it doesn't disgusting work. what ha- what happened to them did the families get money do they get like a like no a, there's no just... like we talk about reparations in this country and you know as a you know a son of Irish immigrants who never owned slaves you know so I'm always like oh that's not you know I shouldn't be charged for it. you know what I mean reparations mm-hmm. and yeah. people who were never slaves getting money from people who never owned slaves never really made too much sense for me and maybe there's something deeper that i need to look into but on the surface that's how i feel i just feel like these kids should get something like their families I even agree. generations later yeah you know what i mean just yeah. the way they're fucked i don't know how much i want them to take out of my pocket right but you know what i mean right. the, yeah, but, I you're saying. but yeah. still it just seems like there's something but either way so there's a scottsboro boys museum in, uh, in Alabama, and if you guys want to go there and, and you know check it out, I uh, I highly recommend it, and I've never been there. All right, let's move on. Uh, this one's not uh, as deep. Trey Miller sent in, hey, Large, great episode. Look up the founder of Lululemon and why he named it that. It relates to the Lollapalooza bit. I had spoke about, maybe it was, maybe it was in Japan. Yeah, I think it was the one on Japan where we talked about the Kappa and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, if there were, if uh, World War II... If um, American GIs were fighting in Japan, and let's say they were in the jungle or something, and there were people going through the wire that they couldn't see, they'd ask if they were American, and they would say yes, and they'd say, well, say Lollapalooza. And once the Japanese people said rah, rah, then you would need to fire at them because Japanese people, their dialect doesn't really include the word L the way that we do. So they have a tough time. As you know, every, mm-hmm. you know, a hokey Japanese and thing is like, you know, I, I don't know, Merry, Merry Christmas, right? Or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, uh, yeah. Christmas story whenever they go to the Japanese restaurant. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's no L, but yeah, yeah, you get it. Yeah. You get it. And I, I know a little bit about the management team from Lulu because I traded Lulu. Yep. Ticker L-U-L-U. I traded retailers when I was at SunTrust, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, Pam Quintiliano was my um, was my research analyst there. I like Pam. So anyway, while I was trading it, maybe it was 2013, their founder, Chip Wilson, had said something because people were complaining about the pilling that was going on, particularly in the crotch or the inner thigh of some of their yoga pants. And he said, frankly, some women's bodies just don't actually work for wearing Lululemon's pants, which was a fat girls need not apply type thing. Like the Abercrombie guy. Yeah. Being like ugly, uh, what do you say? Something like that. Yeah, Yeah. ugly people don't wear clothes or cool people only wear them or something like that. So two things I think had happened in 2013 as I was trading this thing. It wound up that they were see-through. They were see-through. Remember there was a thing like with uh, with like flash bulbs, thank God, that was a great thing. And then the whole thing about how it's not really made for fat girls. Was that so the thing where he, they said someone had, I don't remember who said it, that the stretch pants were a privilege, not a right? Yeah, right, not a privilege, yeah. Um, so the stock went from like 80 to 50 you know, within that year. 
and I had a tough time training to be quite honest with you. I think I think it's like in three fifties now. But either way, I knew that this guy was uh, a little bit of a loose cannon. This guy Chip Wilson. But what I didn't know was what Trey Miller, the guy who sent this letter in, was referring to. Apparently, one of Chip's first companies was a skateboarding company, like a lifestyle brand, skateboarding lifestyle brands like Vans, mm. shit like that. You know what I mean? And it was called Homeless. And uh, he sold that before starting Lulu. And I think he said one of the reasons he was able to sell the company is even though it wasn't a big brand like uh, Vans or, or whatnot, it was very popular in Japan and Japanese people like the name because it had an L in it. And Japanese brands often don't have that sound within their own brands. So it's sometimes they gravitate toward it. Even if they can't pronounce it correctly or if they have to force, force themselves to put out the correct L, he thought that was one of the reasons. So when he was starting Lululemon, he wanted to get something that had an overabundance of L's. Yeah. And the biggest thing that he could think about was Lululemon. And then he even said, uh, the reason the Japanese like my former skateboard brand, Homeless, was because it had the net letter L in it, and a Japanese marketing firm would never come up with a brand with the name with an L in it. L is not in their vocabulary. It's a tough pronunciation for them. So I thought, next time I have a company, I'll make a name with three L's and see if I can get three times the money because it's kind of exotic for them. I was playing with L's. I came up with Lululemon, and now it's funny to try and watch them say it. You think that's why they, they started Uniqlo? New, yeah, maybe. Oh, well, yeah, Korean yeah. brand. No, nope, Japanese yeah. brand. Is it? Is it? Oh, I thought it was Korean. But I, I, Double I, check me, bitches. You well, right away, right. like the same way Once I thought Ra Ra Perusa, Fa Ra 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 Ra, and Ru Ru Remen. That's that is funny to say. You can't really say it out loud, and I apologize. Maybe we'll strike this from the <laughs> tape. But you know, say it to yourself now if you're listening to the car out loud. Ruru Remen is very, very fucking fun to it say. Is. Not clothes. funny. It's fun to say. Uniqlo is a clothing apparel company which originally founded in Yamagachi, Japan. Boom. Nineteen forty nine. There it is. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting for it. Unique row. You're right. Thank you. Oh, uh, you're right. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, so um, we're, we're kind of coming to the end uh, We're going to, like I say We like to have things around this time of year That's just going to make you more interesting at the dinner table Someone's going to come in wearing uh, Lululemon pants At one of your holiday parties And you have that arrow in your quiver uh, Somebody's going to mention Diddy And you're going to talk to him about the time Saddam Hussein had to uh, got the key to Detroit Or they're going to talk about whether or not he did or did he? Right. Did he or did he? Yeah. Uh, maybe they'll talk about Lord Randolph. Probably not. I, I I don't know. I think there's already enough stuff here that's going to make you more interesting to your aunt and uncle. And this might be a tough holiday season. I mean, when your divorced conservative uncle shows up in his cyber truck and parks next to your aunt in her, um, I don't know, uh, Mitsubishi Escape. You know what I mean? Like that type of thing. There's already going to be some contentiousness Absolutely. there. Absolutely. So, uh, so this is probably going to help you out. So we're going to leave you with some more holiday party conversation starters. And it's brought to you, Twisted History is. Twisted History is sponsored by BetterHelp. This month is all about gratitude. And there's a person that we don't get to thank enough, and that's ourselves. It's sometimes hard to remind ourselves that we're trying to be our best to make sense of everything. And in this crazy world, that isn't easy. Here's a reminder to send some thanks to the people in your life, including yourself. BetterHelp does a lot of stuff, as therapy does. Sometimes it's there to set boundaries. Sometimes it's there to empower you to be the best version of yourself. I think at its very core, any kind of therapy just gives you an outlet to talk, to talk shit out. And when you talk shit out, it usually works out pretty well for you. So I highly recommend it. And if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, it's flexible, and it's suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire, you get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for absolutely no additional charge. So, let the gratitude flow with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash twisted today, get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash twisted. All right, so back to it. Uh, before you have people over and you make your playlist for the holidays, consider adding Whoop, There It Is to your background music for the holidays. I think it's instantly recognizable, right? It's one Definitely. of those bangers because they play it all the time. Listen, it's 30 years old, but Chicago clubs 
Chicago Cubs still play it whenever one of their players hits a home run. So whoop, there it is, is still a certified club banger. And then when it comes on and somebody says, I love this song, make sure you point out that tag team were originally strip club DJs in and around Atlanta, particularly Magic City, which is known for its wings and naked women. And uh, the phrase whoop, there it is, like let's say your aunt says, oh, I love whoop, there it is, it gets your shit on. It's something that they would say in the strip club whenever a girl's vagina would fall out of her G-string. Whoop, there it is. And that's an <laughs> occupational hazard. That yeah, has nothing yeah. to do with it. If you work in the field, you get calluses, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a sex worker and sex work is real work, then your vagina starts to look like a donkey yawning. So it's going to pop out of these <laughs> fucking things. And whenever that did, whenever there was a loose flap, they would say, whoop, there it is. They chart, they uh, <laughs> parlayed that into an absolute fucking hit song and put it on your playlist just for no other reason uh, to tell your mom the, uh, use the analogy of a, uh, I don't donkey, know, oversized donkey, donkey, yeah, yawning. Yeah, donkey yawning. That's, yawning. Uh, I won't forget that. That's not a bad <laughs> one, right? Uh, and then when sitting around the table, my son had hit us the other day with how he had heard that the Nickelodeon logo was redesigned to look like an aerial map of Epstein's Island. So mm -hmm. just keep that picture in there because people will believe it. And it's not. It's a stretch. It's a coincidence. But people are dying to believe anything after that documentary exposed to child abuse, sexual and otherwise, that took place surrounding a ton of beloved kid shows. I know that like hurt a lot of people oh, yeah. that Drake and Josh were being diddled. So people want to believe that Nickelodeon. It's not. It's nowhere near this fucking thing. But it kind of does for whatever. Yeah. yeah. So celebrity mouth breathers like Antonio Brown, you know, ran with that. And so it got a little bit of shine. And then when people say it's not true, then just tell them that on a couple of occasions, SpongeBob had to show his driver's license in the cartoon. People close up on it to see the address. And the address on the uh, driver's license, SpongeBob SquarePants, lives at 124 Cont Street in Bikini Bottom. Right, that's that's what it says. I put mm -hmm. the yeah. the thing there. That's also the address of the theme park in uh, Little St. James, which is Epstein's Island. So if you look at it, one two four really? College Street. But the thing is, that's only because Google Maps is like Wikipedia. So people just add that shit in there. You can they see like Cod Street is not even capitalized. Bikini is and bottom isn't. So it's just somebody like being silly. But again, people want to know. I don't want to say it's wanna... fun, but it's fun. Yeah, we talk about that all the time, like fact checking. It's fun this to is talk something... around the table with it. Yeah, I don't even have to fact check this because if you have people who are stupid enough to believe that the people at Nickelodeon purposely made their logo to look like Epstein's Island and then purposely used Epstein's Island address for their beloved SpongeBob SquarePants, there's nothing I can do for you. So I'll just put it out there into the ether. You know what I mean? And then finally, instead of asking everyone at the table this Thanksgiving or Christmas what sexual position should be named after you, I had asked you that the other day, Vibs. Yes. There was a sexual position. Like I've already said, what's ritzy, what's Vibsy? Mm. Like what sexual position? I don't think I want you to answer. Okay. I don't know if there's one that you yeah, want to Yeah, I didn't want say. my name but in it. He, but what if it's good? They're all good. I want like a wrestling move, like my signature finisher? move. Finisher? Yes. That's what I want. Yeah. Like, would it be yeah. Finisher? Yeah. finisher? Yeah. Would it be the middle or the dirt? You know? Oh, it's finisher. <laughs> Are we still talking sex or are you talking about true wrestling moves? Sex. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I wouldn't mind having a finisher in wrestling. Like if that all too. of a sudden you get in there and you throw somebody a large, even though it doesn't sound that great, yeah. and like a Stone Cold Stunner, something like that, a DDT mm -hmm. perhaps, choke slam, Crucifix or, or yeah. something like that. But anyway, so my point is, instead of trying to do that, because it can get uncomfortable, just somebody take out their phone and go to the Urban Dictionary and search the word dirty plus the first name of everybody at your table and then compare which one has the worst sexual position named after them already. Oh, and you grandma. guys didn't have to do the legwork because I did. So let's start with the dirty Jeff. The dirty <laughs> Jeff, according to the Urban Dictionary, and you can look it up. It was entered in there on April 16, 2007, by someone with the, nan with the handle Connie Lingus. And a dirty Jeff involves lying on one's <laughs> back while a female sits on your face. Oral sex is then performed on her. The key is to be a black belt in Tung Fu. Oh, yeah, baby. Her secretions then become heavier and heavier until they fill your lungs, Whack. causing parcel partial asphyxiation. So a dirty Jeff... Wow. is nearly choking on a female's secretions as she sits on your face while you're servicing wow. her. Use it in a sentence. A After a long night of the dirty Jeff, 
I'm having problems breathing, but my girlfriend is very happy. So that's yours. I'm a selfless lover. That's yours. That's the dirty Jeff. Is that autoerotic? Would that be considered that? No, autoerotic is all you. And then there's the dirty John for John Kelly. So the dirty John will rank them. Is that Oh, that's one partner. Sorry. Yeah. Dirty John. After having protected sex Detective. with someone using a condom and you're too lazy to get up to go to the bathroom, but you have to take a leak. You pee in the used condom, then tie it off like a water balloon and leave it next to the bed until you get up later on. Yeah. That's a dirty John. Too much pee. I, yeah. yeah. Pee. yeah. I'm, I don't trust I'm that. hydrated. Yeah. Yeah. You're very fucking hydrated. That's fine. Uh, use that in a sentence. Because he was so exhausted, my boyfriend pulled a dirty John last night. All right. So those are the two. It works for every name. I went through a shitload of names, so unless you have some real secondary and tertiary names in your family, they might be fucked, but you can find something, and I'll show you what I mean by that. The Dirty Annie. What? <laughs> While engaging in, in sexual intercourse, one partner shits onto the other. Oh, I got that. Got that second that partner proceeds to collect the feces and try to push them back Oh. Up their partner's asshole as the original <laughs> partner tries to suck it back in. Oh. I'm not going to use that one in a sentence. No, we won't. We're just and gonna pretend I that. was instead then going to go dirty saint, thinking it might be something oh, more than trying to push better? shit back up your partner's ass. There isn't a dirty saint, but there is a dirty saint Christopher. Saint Christopher what might about be... my full name? Maybe we'll get lucky with that Maybe. One. The Dirty St. Christopher is the... The Dirty St. Christopher. The Dirty Saint, who I think is the patron saint of kids. Yeah. Isn't St. Christopher... No, is, Travel. Is travel? It, I think he's Travel. St. Christopher, I don't know what it was. But the Dirty St. Christopher oh, no. is the art of ejaculating into the face of a priest through oh. the window of a confessional box, <laughs> either consensual or not. Either consensual or not, <laughs> yeah. which means you might say, Father, can you move that screen across? And then you blast into his face like without a, him knowing like it. A silence of the Lambs. <laughs> yeah, like a multiple yeah. mix. I like that. Well, that he's this, the patron saint of travel. So, And I swear to God, so my name, there isn't a dirty large. My given name is Mike. So a dirty Mike, not dirty Mike and the boys. Dirty Mike and the boys. The kitchen. I, if you look, can you go to Urban Dictionary um, and look up dirty Mike? That way people know I'm not lying. Wow. Did you get a really good one? You want me to- Dirty Mike is simply what, Fibsy? Owner of a huge cock. Use it in a sentence. Ooh, that is so mm, fitting. Yeah, yeah dirty, dirty Mike. Mike. That's a fucking sense they give you. Mm, yeah, Dirty Mike. It's simply <laughs> the owner of a huge cock. Is this like Sp- what a home run that is for me? Is this like SpongeBob's address where you can like go in and edit? No, it no, I didn't. I did not edit. I wasn't Connie uh-huh. Lingus yeah. in this one. But oh, no, my real name doesn't have one. Yeah. But um, and listen, <laughs> be careful when you do this because a lot of it. Is more than just the owners of a huge cock. Annie's was pretty bad. Yeah. John's was weird. Vibsy's was kind of bad. But, but I'm married to Dirty Mike. Yes. But my mom's name is Veronica. Did like you, you it's it's an old school name. It shouldn't Did be you in check? there. A dirty Veronica is when you open up a bottle cap with your asshole, pass gas, and shoot the cap <laughs> across the room. Oh, kind of cool. And my mom's like almost eighty. That's a party trick, though. Yeah. My dad's name. My dad's first name is also not a you know a well known. Oh, one. you're doing his real name. My dad's real name is Cornelius. A dirty Cornelius is when a man comes and shits in an ice cream cone to make a chocolate and vanilla swirl. That's the fucking Oh, his worst. sentence is so awful. I could never. I don't even. I didn't even put his man. Name. I just ate a dirty Cornelius. <laughs> oh God. So that's something that I think will make you infinitely oh, more no. interesting. That is, in, so... you know, just check. I'm not it a doing bit. our kids. I'm just not. Yeah, I, I refuse uh, to. My oldest is Michael. I'm I stopping to, there. I refuse to do the kids, which is uh, the Dirty Cornelius was uploaded April 18th, 2020. So like a month into COVID and like yeah, uh, whatever. people just fucking locked the in. Best like, All right, I gotta. I gotta say, you do have to look up the name of like the best one though. Like you should almost Google as many names as you know. Well, it started with Dirty Sanchez, right? Like, so that was the originator of it. And then it went from there to where people just keep, the Urban Dictionary is as big as Wikipedia now. I mean, people just keep throwing stuff in and it's absolutely fascinating. I so tell you what, the Dirty Dave is very funny. Dirty Dave is what? <laughs> the Dirty Dave is, when a girl comes over to your house, is a cock tease and passes out in your bed. You jack off, come on her face, bring in your roommate, 
to laugh and fall asleep next to her. She wakes up the next morning and gets a ride home from you. The following day at work, you quit from embarrassment. I quit my job today. Oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> So that's it. So that's the Twisted History of November 2024 listener submissions. I don't want you guys leaving with uh, that taste in your mouth, either a Dirty David, Dirty Cornelius, Dirty Veronica, whatever it is you want. Or a so dirty I'm going to give you a palate cleanser. One of our favorite things here has always been football chants. Always been football chants. I love them. We did, uh, we did an episode on them. So people consistently send them in to me. Please don't stop. But like I said at the beginning of the show, I was in London a couple weeks ago, and my cousin had added one to us. Apparently, at some point, Manchester United had gotten uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who was just this fucking stud. He was in the. He came in the Chicago office, right? In Zalman yeah. Bananas. Yeah, I mean he's he's massive. Yeah. soccer players have a bajillion followers. On oh man, media. and this guy was like, you don't mess with the Zohan. Like he had that type of right. you know swag to him, and he was very very Mick good. Loves him. One of the all time greats. Yeah, Mick loves him. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I think he was married to like a supermodel. The whole deal. Probably. So um, Manchester United got him from PSG and apparently they didn't have to pay too, which is Paris St. Germain. They didn't have to pay too much for him. Uh, I don't know the ins and outs of it because I don't follow football. But either way, they had this um, chant that they would do when Zlatan was playing for them and they were playing Man City, who are, I guess, the cross-town rivals. Yeah. Man City versus Man United. And uh, what was it? To Yankee Doodle. No. Yeah. So here's how it goes. This is how we're going to leave you. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, he is a Swedish hero. On a free from PSG, he cost us fucking zero. That's already good. Loving it. Six foot five and hard as fuck. He gets the Reds excited. So stick Man City up your ass because we are Man United. I love that shit. So that's it. That's it for us. We want to wish everybody a very happy uh, Thanksgiving. And we also want to remind you, if this thing goes out on Thanksgiving, because we're taping it on the Tuesday of Thanksgiving week, that Black Friday is uh, this week. And it continues through Cyber Monday at the Barstool Sports Store. So go in there. Everything in the store is 20% off. I'm going to be throwing out an incessant amount of ads on my social media platform, as Jeff is going to do, as everyone's going to do, and Annie's also going to do. So it's the Barstool store. You can get it if you just go to any one of the Barstool sites. They have a tab for the store, 20% off the whole store, starting on Black Friday and going through Cyber Monday. I don't believe we're having a telethon this year. No. Instead, no. we're just doing the full court press on this. So um, that's it. Have a very happy Thanksgiving, and we will talk to you guys sometimes before Christmas. Uh, Thank you, Twisted History. God bless you. God bless. Perfect timing.